In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. It is uh, episode 420 this week. Um, actually, those that have been counting along, you might say that number is a little off. <laughs> Chris's idea, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Chris's idea. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who uh, <clears throat> maybe didn't know what we were going to do this week, we're talking about um, marijuana. Uh, I guess there are a number of different nicknames for marijuana. Some of them I, I learned uh, this week. A couple of them were very creative. Texas tea, Acapulco gold. Uh, Chris, what are some other nicknames? Uh, I've heard... California roll before. Okay. Mary Jane. Mary Jane, yep, yep. Uh, Reefer. Reefer. That's an old school one. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, joint. Yeah, joint. That's yeah. the modern vernacular. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, we're talking about marijuana, uh, but before we get to that, um, and, uh, and of course, it's a very complex issue. It's more complex, I think, than people realize. Um, there's a personal question. Should I smoke weed? Uh, but then there's a political one. Uh, <clears throat> should other people be free or have a right to uh, smoke marijuana? And that's uh, a, a more complex question. So it's different than just what I should do. Uh, again, before we get into the topic, though, I uh, just have a couple things to say. Uh, first, on Monday, uh, the Risen Jesus podcast uh, went live. That's a podcast that I am hosting with Dr. Mike Lacona, uh, and it's... Uh, Going, it's just it already is a great program, and I want to encourage you, if you're a listener of this show, to go and subscribe to that. Uh, the first season is talking about Mike uh, and who Mike is. Uh, Mike Lacona, he's the president of Risen Jesus, um, and uh, it's a great ministry he has. And the future seasons are going to delve deep into gospel studies and historiography. It's going to be a lot of fun for me personally to be doing that with Mike. And so, um, yeah, go ahead and subscribe to that uh, if you haven't already. Uh, we would love to get your support for this program. Uh, Veracity Hill is, uh, by and large, funded through the support of donors uh, such as yourself. And we are hoping to build this uh, program into a flourishing radio ministry, a nationwide radio ministry. And so we are in year two of our project here, I guess. And uh, we've certainly upped the quality of our production here. If you go back, you can listen to just the audio. It all started out of my house in a room, the first few episodes, and we slowly built our way up. Uh, and thanks to um, donors and uh, a recent grant that al allowed us to upgrade, uh, hugely upgrade our camera equipment, um, that's been a blessing. So we'd love to get your support. Keep us uh, not just going, uh, but growing as well. So you can do that. Go to veracityhill.com and click on that patron tab uh, to begin donating today. All right, so we're talking about marijuana, and uh, I, um, you might recognize a familiar face on our program. Uh, he's a faculty member at Grantham University, which I believe is outside Kansas City. He's none, o none other than Tim Shao. Tim, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, if those uh, might remember uh, Tim came on when we did the episode uh, to talk about gun control. And uh, those that with a really good memory might remember how I just could not um, keep myself composed upon one of Tim's answers to the, one of the rapid questions about what he would keep with him if he were stranded on an island. And just to give you a brief refresher here, uh, that question usually is answered by uh, people would say my Bible um, or my spouse was another common answer. Uh, Tim's was, uh, I think we had knife too uh, before Tim's answer. Uh, of course, Tim, what was your answer? My gun. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so it was just, it was great. Uh, <laughs> um, and as I told you before our program here, before we started, uh, we do have more questions uh, to rapid questions. So we'll go ahead and do that once we get to our, our midway point with you uh, on today's program. I am uh, Cluing into some of the comments or questions that you might have on 
our main page. Uh, we share the video into different groups, and sometimes I can't keep tabs on all of those uh, comments. But if you have a comment or question about our discussion today, please go to Veracity Hills Facebook page. Uh, you can also text in, text the word Veracity to 555-888, and I'll keep uh, an eye on those comments uh, as well. All right, Tim, um, this is a strange uh, show insofar as usually I have a set of questions that I've prepared for my guests, but I thought, you know, I'd like to have a, a, a true uh, unrehearsed or unprepared conversation uh, with you on today's episode. And so I've started off by talking about the distinction between personal and private. So maybe we should first begin our our program by looking at the personal aspects of marijuana and whether it's something that uh, we as people should consider, uh, you, you know, making an evaluation, a moral evaluation. Is this something we should do? Is it like drinking alcohol? You should do it, you know, in the privacy of your home, uh, as long as you're not bothering anyone else. That's a common line. Um, what are some of the, the pros, if any, uh, and cons of using marijuana yeah so let me let me i'll talk about the morality of marijuana and then i'll uh speak a bit about the legality uh should it be legal or not so um recreational marijuana use i'll be talking about recreational marijuana use the point of recreational marijuana use is to get that intoxicating high it's to you know whether you're smoking a joint eating an edible it's to overwhelm your cognitive faculties to produce a very pleasurable experience now, um, insofar as that impairs your ability to reason, I think that uh, recreational marijuana use is immoral. So our fundamental moral obligation is to pursue what's good, to pursue, to, to avoid what's evil. And in order to do that, we need to be able to reason. We need to be able to deliberate, think, um, and basically just be in control of ourselves. And the problem with re recreational marijuana use is that it it impairs the very thing that makes us rational beings. It impairs the very thing that allows us to act morally. And so it prevents us from acting rationally. And so I think that insofar as um, we're prioritizing that pleasurable high over, you know, the ability to act morally itself, I think that's immoral. Now, I think that argument can also be le leveraged into an argument for making it illegal. So actually, the argument I have for making it illegal is very much a libertarian argument. So libertarians prize freedom, liberty, so on. And marijuana use impairs the very thing that allows us to act freely and rationally, namely the brain. It damages the brain. It impair, there is both acute and long-term effects. Both impair our ability to think. And so insofar as the government has um, the responsibility to protect our freedom, our liberty, and so on, it has the responsibility to protect the conditions that make it possible. So take, here's an example. So take, for example, um, free markets. You know, the government has an obligation to, uh, you know, ensure freedom of exchange. And in order to do that, it must, it must protect certain fundamental structural conditions like the rule of law, courts, uh, other conditions like that. And same thing for rationality when it comes to protecting our liberty, the government must protect certain structural conditions, one being clarity of thought. And so because marijuana undermines our capacity to reason, there is a libertarian case to be made. If you're a libertarian, you should be in favor of marijuana restrictions because marijuana impairs the very thing that allows you to act freely uh, to use your liberty. So that's, that's the one minute, two minute rundown of why I think marijuana use is immoral and why I think the government should have um, a role in restricting it. All right. Um, there are many questions that can come out of this uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, uh, I'm making a note here to, we, we're talking about recreational use. Uh, yeah. There's also the medical use, uh, but let's, mm -hmm. let's pause on that. I'm making a note here. You said, uh, and, and just so you know, I mean, I think some of my questions might be from playing devil's advocate of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, you said that the government has a duty to, um, you'll have to clarify my language here, a duty to uh, retain order and structure in a society. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, being of a clear mind is part of that. Mm -hmm. So would you say, if, if you're of the opinion that 
um, using marijuana is immoral. Would you also say that getting drunk is immoral? Yeah, it's a good question. So I he's, think he smiles big as I ask him. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a big difference when it comes to marijuana use and alcohol. So alcohol can, in principle, be consumed without the intention to get drunk. I mean, people uh, sometimes just you just to enhance their dinner to relax, whereas the whole point of smoking a joint is to get high. I don't know of anybody who smokes a joint and doesn't intend to get high. So the primary purpose of mar recreational marijuana use is to get that overwhelming, intoxicating high, whereas it's not, it's not essential to alcohol use. So now that being said, I would favor, because alcohol does lead uh, sufficient amounts to intoxication, I would be in favor of alcohol restrictions, albeit not as restrictive as marijuana um, restrictions. Because, namely, of the difference, you know, marijuana is primarily used to um, impede your rational faculties, whereas for alcohol, that is not always sought after. We're, we're speaking of um, something as being an immoral act. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm sure we're going to spend the, the chunk of our program today talking about this distinction. Um, mm -hmm. In a moral act, however, uh, you know, lying is an immoral act, but the mm -hmm. government doesn't regulate every instance of lying. Mm -hmm. So should it be the case that people should be free um, to do immoral actions? So we don't want the government regulating every single thing we do. Do we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in most cases, I would agree. And but I would say that psychoactive drugs merit a special carve out from that. So, you know, I, so the approach I take is a libertarian one. You know, the government has a responsibility to care about uh, to protect the conditions for freedom, for liberty, for rationality, so on and so forth, because psychoactive drugs work by um, impeding, impairing frustrating the very conditions that you need to act freely and which is a precondition for just exercising your freedom i think psychoactive drugs merit a special carve out a special exception from just any other immoral act so my action my, my argument sorry is not that we should make marijuana illegal because it's immoral rather we should make marijuana illegal because it interferes with the capacity to act freely. So there's, so I do think marijuana use, recreational marijuana use is, Ill, is immoral, but I don't base my case for immorality off its being immoral. I would agree with you that there are immoral things like lying um, that the government shouldn't have an interest in regulating. Yeah, and, and I ask that question because when it pertains to alcohol, you're right that, you know, alcohol doesn't have that immediate effect or people don't do it for the sake of getting drunk. Um, some people do, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I would agree that getting drunk is immoral and something that ought not be done. But at the same time, you know, I'm not sure, I wouldn't go so far to say that the government should prohibit people from, say, getting drunk in their own homes. Um, you know, to have to regulate that, I think, could get a little complicated. So why can't it be um, the case that people should be able to get high in the privacy of their own homes. Yeah, so I'm not saying that the government should knock down your door and you know come in, search your house, and take away any weed or alcohol you have. My position is that, so one, there's several points you can make. One thing is that, um, practically speaking, when it comes to alcohol, marijuana, these things have bleed over effects to third party. So, you know, you're getting drunk, it isn't, no man is an island, you're getting drunk um, in very rare cases will just harm you, but you also have, you know, friends, family, dependents, people you are obligated to. And as a matter of fact, you, you know, alcohol does affect that. So, um, just speaking in terms of harm to third parties, I think that, um, there, there's a case to be made because that, I mean, uh, you can make the case that, well, marijuana, um, you know, it, it, there's, there's secondhand smoke, it, it leads to dereliction of duty for your family members, uh, impaired driving, much the same harm as alcohol, right? So I think uh, insofar as the government does regulate alcohol, it's because of the um, harmfulness to third parties. Now, I do think, however, because uh, psychoactive drugs merit a special carve-out, I do think that uh, there is a uh, mild form of paternalism here where I do think the government... 
justify protecting people from themselves. And here is why. So on a libertarian view, the government's job is to protect people from coercion, unjust coercion. Now, marijuana works by impairing executive functions, specifically inhibitory control. And so in doing that, marijuana um, opens the door for external coercive forces to uh, basically influence how you act. And insofar as you were co coerced in that way, I think for psychoactive drugs in general, the government has an interest in protecting you from them because they open the door to that kind of coercion. Same thing with drunkenness, too. I mean, so suppose I – and it's different from just general acts of immorality in the privacy of your own home, right? Suppose I lie to my parents, right? That doesn't uh, generate any kind of coercion, whereas from the, the activity of getting drunk or the activity of getting high does generate coercion. Many people who are drunk or get high – do things they otherwise would not do because they are coerced in that state. And so I think, again, there is a special carve-out we can make for psychoactive drugs that are different from any other cases of immorality. So that's why I base, I base my argument on um, psychoactive drugs impairing your rationality, thereby impairing your ability to act free, not, not because of the general immorality of things. But couldn't the government uh, simply regulate or, you know, firmly regulate its use. Yeah, I mean, um, there are different, there are varying degrees of prohibition, right? Even under alcohol prohibition, which many, many people think, well, alcohol prohibition banned alcohol completely. Actually, under alcohol prohibition, it was still okay to personally consume alcohol. Alcohol prohibition in the United States only banned the uh, sale and distribution of alcohol. So maybe for prudential reasons, we could say that marijuana prohibition could take a similar a similar approach in that you ban the sale and distribution and production of alcohol, but leave personal consumption in your own home legal. And that, that, would, that would achieve roughly the same effects, but it would be slightly less restrictive. So there are varying degrees of prohibition. And we don't have to say that, well, if you're committed to bit banning marijuana, you must be committed to banning, you know, every single aspect of it. So there, there's um, degrees of prohibition we might take. Yeah, like I said, it's a it's a complex issue um, mm -hmm. from looking at the personal aspect and the political one. And uh, here you brought up uh, something I hadn't even considered is regulating the economy of it um, mm -hmm. as opposed to just regulating its use. Uh, so yeah, maybe there's a case where if the government wanted to say, hey, you can't uh, you know, buy or sell, but if people want to grow it in their own homes. Uh, now, the current, um, the current um, law of the land w wouldn't even allow that, uh, mm -hmm. and that's because the federal government has, has prohibited it, um, although it depends on the – and I'd have to look here um, – the state governments do a lot of the enforcing – uh, you know, there's no national police force, uh, and except there, there is a, you, you do have a force of sorts that works at the southern border. Um, so that's that's an issue all on its own. Uh, what to do there on the southern border? <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on that, Tim? Yeah. So basically, so as, as it stands right now, the Supreme Court ruled in Gonzalez v. Reich that the federal government has the authority to prohibit marijuana. Now, whether or not that's a good idea, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of a state's right guy myself, and I do think that when it comes to the federal government, I, I do think, so I think marijuana should be banned, but I think that primarily it should be a matter of the states. So- Oh, so um, we see eye to eye there. Yeah, I just, I, just, I, I just don't think that, the states should have the right to ban marijuana, right? I just think that, um, so, Currently, it, it's, it's pretty complex right now uh, as it stands. So the state does or the, the federal government does most of the regulating when it comes to the Controlled Substances Act. Right. You know, what counts as medicine. The FDA is in charge of that. Currently, marijuana is a Schedule One drug. Um, as, for, I, as for how medicine is regulated, um, that I might see, you know, a role for the federal government insofar as, you know, the need for consistency and stuff like that. But when it comes to just general, you know, drugs and, and that, maybe there's a case to be made for uh, states' rights. So you're okay uh, looking at this from uh, the medicinal angle, 
right? Mm-hmm. So when we're sometimes talking about this, we're talking about recreational use. Um, but mm-hmm. the medicinal angle is really how this all got started in our society was it came in, um, doctors were prescribing it to cancer patients to help alleviate pain. And um, at least as I'm trying to understand how this issue has become such a prominent one, it's been through that door, the medicinal one. Uh, And so for you, you would say that the federal government uh, should be able to regulate what constitutes as medicine. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in your opinion, do you think medicinal use of marijuana is um, permissible, should we say? Yeah. So this is a very complex issue. Uh, currently, right now, marijuana is classified as a Schedule One drug, meaning that it has no medicinal, ex- no accepted medicinal use. Now, uh, to say that marijuana is medicine, it's, it's sort of a misleading question. There is mar- the marijuana plant, And there is marijuana extracts. The marijuana plant is not medicine. That's why it's classified as a Schedule I drug. Now, marijuana does have compounds in it, THC and CBD, that do have potential medical use. So the first distinction we should make is between the marijuana plant and the marijuana compounds. The marijuana plant is not medicine. That's why it's classified as a Schedule I drug. Now, the marijuana compounds is a different story. Currently, right now, there's a number of uh, marijuana-based drugs that are going through the process of FDA approval. I think uh, Marinol has been FDA approved since, I believe, 1985, and a few days ago, um, Epidiolex uh, was approved, which is, I think, pure CBD, was approved as a drug under the FDA. So I would distinguish between the marijuana plant, which is clearly not medicine, and the extracts, uh, which are which can be medicine. So I would be in favor of medical marijuana insofar as you take the medicinally beneficial compounds or extracts from the plant and manufacture that into a pharmaceutically pure drug, which we have done, and which there currently are federally legal based legal drugs which are based on the marijuana plant. I would not, however, be in favor of legalizing the smoked or the raw marijuana plant as medicine any more than um, you know, I'd be in favor of, so take opium, for example, right? Opium, uh, morphine is derived from opium and morphine is the medicinally beneficial aspect of, uh, opium, but I would not be, I would not call a raw opium plant medicine in the same way. I wouldn't call the raw marijuana plant medicine. So when people speak of mar- medical marijuana, it's sort of misleading. They usually speak of the raw plant when, when, you know, uh, States have legalized medical marijuana. It's typically the raw plant, but that is not medicine. No uh, medical organization, state or federal, recognizes the marijuana plant as accepted medicine. It's only the THC or the CBD that has some medical benefit. Even then, it's very limited. There is the evidence on this is rather controversial. So that's that's the nutshell answer. I'm sure you can ask more follow-up questions on that. Yeah, yeah. So I want to I want to take a step back here. Uh, and look at how we're analyzing this. So <clears throat> there's a distinction between medicinal use and, and, and by that there are subcategories of, you know, smoking or taking a, um, a refined version uh, mm-hmm. of it, which still has the same chemical compounds or some of the same chemical compounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, then there's the recreational use, uh, which certainly has implications. Uh, I know in the state of Colorado, for instance, uh, which was one of the first states to legalize recreational use, if not the first, Tim, was it the first state? Uh, I believe so. I'm not, I'm not too familiar. I, I know, I know it's definitely, it was, it was legalized recreational in 2014. I don't know if it was the first state. Yeah. I believe well, so. I think they are discovering some of the ramifications of doing so. Um, they have, you know, for, ex- for example, the amount of traffic accidents uh, mm-hmm. increased. Um, and that's, that's clearly an instance when, you know, you, the government failed to regulate this because th- there were people that were dying as a result of drivers being high. And that's mm-hmm. certainly something you don't want. Um, mm-hmm. So if there is an attempt to uh, legalize recreational use, it should be heavily regulated, uh, it seems. 
Um, so we've got, um, all right, so we've got these different categories. We've got medicinal use. We've got recreational use. We also have the scope of regulation. Um, right. Is it the duty of the state uh, or is it the duty of the federal government? And some people are in strong support of the federal government uh, prohibiting this. And uh, the result of that is causing uh, all sorts of gang violence. Uh, you've got the drug runners. Um, you have underground tunnels going from Mexico to the United States. Uh, one of them, I think, uh, I don't know if it was drug related, but I remember a tunnel came up through KFC. Um, I got to look this up. Because maybe it was for drug use. Yeah, it was a drug tunnel. <laughs> a drug tunnel under KFC. Uh, Arizona police find Breaking Bad style. Uh, oh, that's funny. Yeah. So uh, Breaking Bad style tunnel. Um, so you, you clearly have people here trying to find ways around the federal regulations. Um, literally around. Uh <laughs> Uh, in order to provide this so-called good for people to have and use. Um, and it's creating um, a ripple effect. Uh, Tim, like you mentioned, I mean, the action is not just individuated. People are affected by the, right. this act, and they're affected by these decisions. And so what is the one of the best ways for uh, a society... I don't want to say government. What's one of the best ways for a society to um, de-incentivize people from doing something? Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's what it gets down to is how do you have these disincentives um, from people doing something you don't want them to do in general? Of course, there's always the individual aspect of, hey, I don't think you should do that. You know, there's a peer pressure. You know, drugs is not cool. I remember, Tim, I don't know if you grew up with this, but I had the D.A.R.E. program in elementary school, right, mm -hmm. which taught about, you know, drug education. Um, so, <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, what we're going to do here, uh, we're going to take a short break. Uh, when we come back from the break, we're going to do our second round of rapid questions with Tim. He's been on the program before. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of the upcoming elections that are talking, uh, well, on Tuesday, some of the people are going to be voting upon their states. I'm going to mention which states those are and what issues they're going through. And we'll keep talking about uh, the uh, topic of marijuana uh, with Tim Shaw on our program today. Stick with us through the short break from our sponsors. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Have you heard of the Google Ad Grant for nonprofits? 501c3 nonprofit organizations can receive $10,000 per month in online advertising credit from Google, empowering you to share your message with the world. At Defenders Media, we partnered with Nonprofit Megaphone, an agency focused solely on Google grant acquisition and management. They got us approved for the grant and now manage ad campaigns, bringing hundreds of new people to our websites each month. If you are eligible, Nonprofit Megaphone will acquire and manage the grant for you for a month for free to see if they can help you too. Visit nonprofitmegaphone.com to learn more. Thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. If you'd like to learn how you can become a sponsor, go to our website, veracityhill.com, and click on that patron tab where you can learn about uh, the great uh, opportunities we have for you to sponsor with us uh, for this program. All right, Tim. Uh, well, it's no surprise you've done rapid questions before, and uh, I've got some new questions here. Uh, there are a number of people that said, "Hey, you got to get some more, qu more variety, greater variety." So we've got like, I mean, hundreds of questions that I now have to scroll through and just pick at random. Um, so some of them you won't see coming. All right. Mm. 
Are you ready? So we've got 60 yeah. seconds on the game clock here. And uh, I will ask the first question as soon as it starts. Did you have a dream last night? I did. I dreamed about a game I played. <laughs> uh, do you like to dance? Uh, I can't say I do. Uh, have you ever lived abroad? For about a week. Uh, let's see. When's the last time you swam in a pool? Ooh, half a year ago. Would you go bungee jumping or skydiving? Heck yeah. Uh, do you have a garden? Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, who was the last person you ate dinner with? Uh, probably somebody at my church. Do you believe in love at first sight? <laughs> probably not. If you had a big win in the lottery, how long would you wait to tell people? I wouldn't tell people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? A medical doctor. And uh, where would you like to retire? Probably Florida, where I grew up. Florida. Very yeah. nice. Excellent. Well, thank you for playing that round of rapid questions. I have a number of follow-ups, of course. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you're dreaming of a video game. Uh, so, of yep. course, I didn't have time to ask this because of the clock. All right. So what yep. video game was it? So don't laugh, but I play a lot of Minecraft. <laughs> I was reading about Minecraft. Not only do you play a lot of it, but uh, he's... Oh, oh, Chris, uh, my tech uh, producer says there's a poster uh, in your background of Minecraft. Yep, yep. <laughs> nice. A devoted mm -hmm. Minecraft player. Yep. Sweet. Um, all right, so you grew up in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. You went to Florida State, which is the... Yep. Um, school my wife went to as well. What year did you graduate? Uh, I graduated with my bachelor's in 2014 and my master's in 2015. Gotcha. Okay. So there, were, I don't think there would have been overlap. You would have just missed each other. Mm. She graduated in 2010. So, mm. all right. And you grew up in Florida, uh, Panhandle or? The peninsula. The peninsula. Fort Myers area. Oh, okay. Nice. And so now you find yourself uh, all the way in, was I right? Kansas City, right? Yeah, Kansas City. Is it the, a lot of people don't know this, it's a city in two different states. Um, yeah. There's the uh, Missouri side, and there's the Kansas side. So which side are you on? I'm on the Kansas side, which is the better side. It's a better side. Yeah. Lower taxes? More freedom? Yeah, actually, if you live in the Kansas City metro area, there's an added 1% city tax, which, Ugh. I don't want to pay that. Yeah. So I, I <laughs> I live in the Kansas side, which is, which is low taxes, so it's good. Nice. Cool. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. And you teach various classes uh, there. I mean, you're a big ethics professor, right? Yep. It's your main line, teaching ethics courses. So mm -hmm. uh, for those that want to uh, hear some of Tim's great stories, you can uh, find him on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> and he has a website as well. Uh, you can go to timshow.org. Uh, that's shao, H-S-I-A-O. TimShow.org. Uh, all right, so we're talking about um, marijuana on our program today, and uh, it, it's been a while since we've done a political show uh, episode, and so I'm glad uh, we picked this one. There is some relevancy uh, with the elections on Tuesday, the midterm elections. There are some states voting on that, so I want to just go through some of them. So there are two states voting on um, a statewide ballot measure for recreational use, Michigan and North Dakota. Uh, so in Michigan, uh, it would be Proposition, uh, let's see here, uh, Michigan, uh, this, this comes from the Rolling Stone, Michigan could become the first state in the Midwest to legalize recreational, recreational cannabis use, joining nine other states if voters pass Proposition 18-1. So if you live in Michigan, pay attention to Proposition 18-1. Uh, there, there is some regulation here, according to the description. Uh, North Dakota would uh, be uh, the state ballot measure number three. Um, so North Dakota's uh, another state. The state's be uh, measure three would remove hashish, marijuana, and this is a medical term, tetrahydrocannabinols. Cannabinols, thank you. Boy, that's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. From its list of Schedule One substances, ultimately making recreational pot use legal for all adults. Uh, and then there are uh, medicinal measures in Utah and Missouri. Uh, so, Tim, you will not get to vote on that. Um, <laughs> but if you probably lived 10 minutes to the east, yeah. uh, you could. Uh, so those are up for um, 
for uh, not discussion at this point for uh, casting a ballot. If you live in those states uh, or if you know someone who does, let them know. Let them know your opinion as well. Um, I am very much an encourager of people getting involved in the political process. It's very important. George Washington called this the great experiment. And so uh, educating people is highly important in the great experiment in order for the democracy to survive. Uh, and you think I'm exaggerating. I'm actually not exaggerating. <laughs> Very important. Uh, especially, oh my gosh, today with the isolation of the parties, uh, the rhetoric, uh, and now even more so the violence. Uh, it's really a problem. We need to learn how to be civil and have civil conversations. And hopefully this program uh, contributes to that. Uh, it's been an example of how to do that. Uh, so, Tim, all right, let's get back to our main thrust of discussion today. Again, something different here for me, having no prepared questions. So let's just converse. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think we see eye to eye that the federal government uh, should not be regulating recreational use. But you said you were okay with the FDA, say, regulating medicinal use. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, as it stands right now, the federal government does have that authority. And, uh, you know, given that it does have that authority, personally, I don't have a problem with it saying no weed because... But I'm, should you know, it have that authority? That's the question. Should it, should it have that authority? No. Should, does it actually have it? Yeah, Gonzalez... Interestingly enough, in Gonzalez v. Reich, Justice Scalia actually wrote um, a concurring opinion where he argued that basically the federal government does have the... Uh, authority to regulate marijuana at the federal level. So that might be, uh, you know, something that uh, is compatible with a uh, strict textualist reading of the Constitution. Doesn't mean he's, he was right, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I like to ask myself, and it's it's true that the, the Constitution has changed, the, the laws governing uh, our federal government have changed over time. But I like to ask myself the question, what would the founders have believed? What was the founders' vision for the nation? And certainly it's true that they were unable to implement many of their ideas. Uh, what they envisioned couldn't have been brought about in, in the immediacy. Uh, it would take time. So, for example, slavery. Um, I, I bring this up because a lot of people don't know that one of the earlier drafts of the Declaration of Independence, uh, Thomas Jefferson talked about how uh, Africans were humans. And um, that was actually, unfortunately, scrubbed from one of the earlier drafts. He talked about humans being traded for sale in London. Uh, and so, you know, when people ask what was Thomas Jefferson's views, uh, and why did the founders themselves, when they supported abolition, but they still had slaves, why didn't they do this? I think because some social structures uh, were limiting in what they could and could not do. Uh, so there were unfortunate circumstances, we'll say. So all this to say, uh, without going too far on a rabbit trail, with regard to marijuana, you know, what would the founders have done? Uh, it seems they certainly allowed it. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't regulate it back then. Uh, now, today, we have uh, greater technology, um, say, you know, motor vehicles, which can allow uh, the surveying and going and finding people. And, oh, no, there's this, you know, uh, there's a marijuana farm. Let's go over there. To, you know, so it's much easier to regulate than, say, the founders. So, Tim, in your opinion, would the founders have um, been in support of regulating marijuana use? Well, hemp was in use back then. Uh, I think the best example, the best analog we have is tobacco. Uh, tobacco was pretty prominent back in the colonial times, and um, there were taxes on tobacco. So I, I do think that you know uh, regulating that would have been in the purview of the government. Now, whether or not it should be state governments or federal governments, I just don't know enough about what the founders thought about that. But certainly, they didn't think it was you know, out of the domain of the government to regulate these substances because mm. they, did, they did have tobacco taxes, for example. I mean, some people call it Texas tea. Why couldn't it have been the Boston tea? You know, <laughs> yeah. gives a whole new meaning to the Boston Tea Party, if you ask me. <laughs> um, I, did, I did want to address the... 
question you brought up that before the break uh, about the scope of marijuana regulation. So if I could say a few things about that. Yeah, please. Uh, so I think we can learn a good lesson from alcohol prohibition. Many people think that alcohol prohibition was just this abysmal failure. Actually, it's not as it seems. Several things. First, alcohol prohibition actually reduced alcohol consumption by about 30 to 50 percent. So it had an effect in reducing not just alcohol consumption, but admissions to mental hospitals, alcohol-related diseases, cirrhosis of the liver. So prohibition does reduce consumption. It does reduce – it makes it harder for people to get um, you know, the substance they need. So in that respect, it reduces uh, consumption. Now, many people also have this idea that alcohol prohibition led to a, a crime wave. Actually, it's not it's, – the evidence for that is not clear at all. Crime was already rising prior to prohibition. In fact, uh, crime peaked at a time before prohibition. And what's more, the idea that around that time you had a lot of urbanization, right? People were moving to big cities, and crime tends to be correlated in big cities, not not because of anything, you know, alcohol or whatever, but because it's big cities. And also around the time, uh, the amount of uh, areas that uh, the, statistics, the statistics were being collected rogue, and so you had this artificial effect of uh, it appeared that the homicide rate was rising, but it was just due to better data collection. And in fact, there's a paper by Emily Green Owens where she argues that alcohol prohibition actually had the effect of reducing crime, and that it reduced um, harms from you know intoxication, people drinking too much, so on and so forth. And finally, I want to say that. Alcohol prohibition failed not because it was impractical, but because it lost political support. In the in the wake of the Great Depression, people wanted to get more tax revenue, and so uh, prohibition lost political support. But in terms of you know its practicality, it would have worked um, had it had a sufficient uh, enforcement regime and had states dedicated more resources to enforcing it. So what we can learn from marijuana is that prohibition does work in reducing demand. And it does supply and demand, and it does work in reducing the amount of social harms. So uh, prohibition is not this failed experiment that many people thought it was. Actually, and I talk about this in one of my papers, prohibition actually had a net positive effect on society. So it could be the case that the federal government should continue regulating, right? You said it has, it currently has the authority, but that doesn't necessarily mean it ought to. But there mm-hmm. still is uh, clearly a good that is resulting from it. Uh, but mm-hmm. the question is, is there uh, a greater good available? And if it's not the federal government, perhaps the state governments are the mm-hmm. ones that should be um, regulating their statewide economies. Some mm-hmm. people might say that's hard to do, um, I, I, I really get confused with people who think that when state governments have trouble doing something, they think the federal government doesn't also have trouble doing mm-hmm. something. <laughs> uh, that somehow that, that error is prone to their thinking. Um, so while you talk about how there was this good that resulted from prohibition, um, mm-hmm. but you're still not, you wouldn't say you would su- support a continuation of the prohibition era regulations, Right. Well, if it were, if it were, so prohibition was, um, it was a constitutional amendment, right? It wasn't just a law, right? And right. actually, na- national prohibition followed several years of state prohibition. First, several states prohibit, prohibited alcohol, and then the federal government adopted a, a constitutional amendment. Now, I wouldn't have a problem with um, a another federal level prohibition of marijuana. Provided, you know, it followed the same steps as alcohol prohibition. In, in principle, I'm open to the idea. Now, I think it's better to enforce because the state, the states are what do the enforcing, even under alcohol prohibition. It was the state who carried out enforcement. So I would think that if we do enact prohibition, it should be at the state level. But I wouldn't have a problem in principle with uh, federal prohibition. Mm. Um, but you say in principle. So what, what's your reasoning behind that? Well, I think that it would be just more efficient uh, if it were done at the state level because states can do states states can do things better than the federal government in general. So if if if, if you know the states voted for a constitutional amendment or we got we got sufficient you know backing behind that, I wouldn't have a problem with you know 
a constitutional amendment banning marijuana. But as a matter of fact, I think it's because at, at, I mean, at the state level, most of this is done by constitutional amendments. Right. So it's not it's not a big leap from a state level thing to a federal level thing. It's just a constitutional amendment. But I, I do think that when it comes to regulation, it should be the state that state level at the state level. Sorry. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm with you there. Uh, I, I would I'm not sure I would say that I think the federal government should even in principle do it. Um, but that could just be a political difference, uh, how we're interpreting the constitution or something like that. Um, or whether it would be, um, well, you're saying it's efficient for, it's more efficient for the states. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So that's so as a potential matter of fact, the states should do it. Yeah. All right. Uh, give us the rundown about why, um, people themselves shouldn't smoke pot. And, and, and I ask for that because Tony here, uh, he's got a, uh, comment or question. He says, if it could be shown smoking pot has a limited effect on some conditions, shouldn't it be legal? Yeah, so it's about weighing the benefits and the odds when it comes to... Um, so by benefits, I, I, I assume he means medicinal purposes. So when it comes to that, um, you have to ask, Give suppose there are medicinal benefits to THC or CBD. Well, you have to ask yourself, um, what about the side effects? And I think that smoking pot as a method of delivery is not exactly the best way to get whatever medical benefits there are. I mean, given right now there are THC and CBD forms of uh, uh, pure pharmaceuticals. So there's uh, Sativex, there's Sesamet, there's Marinol, there's Epidolex. And so I think those pharmaceuticals would be the more efficient way, the more prudential, the, the better, the more, the less reckless way of administering marijuana at the medical level. But I don't think that smoking with all of its carcinogenic effects would be an efficient method of delivery, nor would I think something like, you know, an edible would be okay, but because you can't really control the dosage of that. And that's really just, you know, yet the, I can get into the whole, that, that's a whole other thing, but I think the best way, if there are medical benefits of marijuana to get them, is by means of basically how you, cause, uh, how we take medicine right now. Because it's one thing for a doctor to say, well, smoke a joint uh, for your pain. And it's another thing for a doctor to say, take 100 milligrams of amoxicillin twice a day. The, I think the second one's more uh, narrow, more efficient, more uh, safer in terms of getting the medical benefits of medicine. All right. Um, now, he doesn't clarify in his comment if it's medicinal. So mm -hmm. let, let's take it out for, again from a recreational perspective. Uh, if, and here's his comment again. If it could be shown smoking pot has a limited effect on some conditions, shouldn't it be legal? So uh, when it comes to the non-medical benefits of marijuana, it's the research really doesn't show that there are any non-medical benefits besides getting high. Right. All the research show all the research is a large consensus of research showing that marijuana decreases IQ. It uh, increases the propensity for dependence and use of other drugs, interferes with cognition, interferes with inhibitory and executive control. So, um, you know, if, if you could, I, I just do, I just I mean, if you could argue that there is a non medicinal benefit, it would have to be pretty darn good given what we know about um, marijuana's negative effects right now. There's a good article, a 2014 article in the New England Journal of Medicine titled Adverse Health Effects of Marijuana that I'd recommend anybody read. It's a good summary of the negative health effects of marijuana, both acute and long-term. So from government, federal government, state government, peer groups to individual, um, Federal government, you say, yeah, I mean, it currently has the authority, but maybe it shouldn't. State governments, mm -hmm. you say, this is the best efficient way to regulate. Peer groups, you say, no, we shouldn't be doing that because uh, it has all sorts of bad effects. And even the individual, you say, no, it has all sorts of bad effects and shouldn't be put to use. Is that accurate? Well, when it comes to legislation, I think that states, um, that should be the role of the states. Now, when it comes to discouraging people, changing their attitudes, changing their perceptions, the best work there is done at the individual level, you know, um, parent groups, uh, local organizations, drug rehab organizations. I think those groups do the best work in spreading awareness about the dangers of, of not just marijuana in general, but psychoactive drugs in general. And so 
um, in terms of discouraging people to use drugs, I think that local uh, advocacy organizations do the best job at that. When it comes to legislation, I think that state state governments should uh, spearhead that. Tim, this has been a uh, encouraging conversation, a fluid one. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, it's a very complex issue. And um, for those that are interested to read, uh, Tim, you've got a few articles. Maybe before you go here, tell us, uh, let's see, we're going to put these links uh, in our chat here for people to check out. You've got a few articles here. Tell us about them. Yeah, so I've got an article in Ethics and Medicine titled The Case for Marijuana Prohibition. And I go into a lot more detail, a lot more than I could say here. I go into extensive detail on why I think marijuana should be banned, why um, so that why the alcohol objection doesn't work, why a bunch of objections don't work, what about medical marijuana. I have another article in the National Catholic Bioethics Quarterly on why marijuana consumption is immoral. So I have one article on why it should be illegal, one, it should, one on why it should be immoral. I have another article in the Public Discourse, which is the Journal of the Witherspoon Institute, um, titled The Libertarian Case for Drug Prohibition, which I argue that libertarians should be opposed to marijuana legalization. And finally, uh, coming out next week, I will have an article in Arc Digital, uh, basically following up on the uh, public discourse article, explaining what, in more detail why libertarians should oppose marijuana legalization. If you can convince the libertarians, then you're uh, <laughs> you're off to a good start. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tim, thank you again for joining us on our program today for enlightening us of the. Uh, the cautions we should have uh, when talking about um, marijuana use from recreational uh, to medicinal and how uh, even still with the medicinal aspect, there, there are better ways to move forward than just a you know, full-scale endorsement. Um, and so we should be thoughtful in how we approach this very complex issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, no problem. All right, well... Um, I hope that this episode has been encouraging to you. Uh, again, for those that live in the states uh, that I mentioned, let's see if I can remember them. Utah and Missouri was going over medicinal. Michigan and North Dakota was voting on recreational. Those votes, uh, if you haven't voted already, uh, Tuesday is election day. Uh, so pay attention to those ballot measures. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed the, the political episode as well. It had been a long time, and I think we've got a few more coming up. Let me take a look at uh, our schedule coming up. We've got some great guests. Oh, and, and uh, I should mention, my wife is pregnant, and she is due next week. So uh, I am not sure whether I will be here, if we'll have to uh, air a pre-recorded episode, or heaven forbid, Chris, that we not have an episode at all. Um, yeah, we've never done that. We've we've been bringing new content to you week after week now for 420 episodes. Wait a second. No, not quite right. <laughs> um, all right, so next week we do have scheduled Greg Gansel, a uh, God in Time. But in a few weeks, the last call for liberty with none other than Oz Guinness. That is scheduled for November 24th. Uh, those... Uh, who have been long followers of the program know that I'm a huge Oz Guinness fanboy. Uh, so that'll be a great episode and, again, a political-themed one as well. If you have episode uh, recommendations, I would love to hear them. I'd love to reach out to people for some topic or if you have a specific person in mind. Uh, I would love to get the feedback from you. And please don't forget to uh, consider reviewing us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Uh, we'd love to get those reviews up and going um, and and. Uh, regular, uh, even our Facebook page. We'd love to get a review that you can then uh, have for people to come and when they come to our page, they can see, hey, what do others think about this program? We'd love to get your thoughts. All right, well, that does it for the episode today. I am grateful for the continued support of our uh, patrons and the partnerships that we have with our sponsors. They are, and Chris is going to queue up the image. He's already got it. Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, The Illinois Family Institute, Fox Restoration, and Nonprofit Megaphone. I want to thank our technical producer, Chris, for all the great work that he does, and to our guest today, Tim Shaw. And last but not least, I want to thank you for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. 
This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.